It's Baltimore City Council Judiciary and Legislative Investigations Committee. We are here to start hearing charter amendments. First bill is Council Bill 18-0222, Charter Amendment Equity Assistance Fund. I'm joined to my left by Vice Chair of the Committee, Councilwoman Mary Pat Clark Thank from the 14th you. District. To her left, Council President Bernard C. Jack Young. To his left, uh, Councilman Brandon Scott, 2nd District Member of the Committee. To his left, Councilman John Bullock, 9th District Member of the Committee. To his left, Councilman Chris Burnett. Uh, and then to my uh, far right, uh, Councilman Robert Stokes, 12th District Member of the Committee. To his right, Councilman Leon Pickett, 7th District Member of the Committee. We're also joined by Rebecca Tabb who is the independent attorney for the city council. We have Kara Kunst, who is uh, director of legislative affairs for Council President Young. Um, we have Karan Banks representing Mayor Catherine Pugh, also a uh, poetry deal, and Karen Stokes from Mayor's Office of Government Relations. Uh, we have Lester Davis, who is uh, deputy chief of staff to Council President Young, and Michael Huber, director of economic development for Council President Young. To my immediate right is Matt Peters, uh, staff to the committee. Um, first, this hearing is being televised on Channel 25 on Comcast, as well as uh, streamed online. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to turn it over to the chief sponsor of this Charter Amendment, Councilman Brandon Scott, for a brief comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, uh, members of the council, those in the public who are here or watching, uh, this, of course, is the companion bill to the equity assessment program that we passed last week here in the Judiciary Committee. We all know, again, that Baltimore has a horrible record, a horrible history of being a city of inequity, especially when it comes to African Americans in Baltimore not providing them the same opportunities for success and to thrive in the city of Baltimore. And knowing that and knowing exactly that our equity assessment that will be forthcoming from the agencies will show that that still exists in the city of Baltimore. We know that city dollars needs to be spent in our communities to help re reduce that, in our communities to, to help take away those years, those decades of, of purposeful disinvestment in East and West Baltimore and other areas of the city where uh, black people live and make sure that they too are having the benefit. So this is why we introduced the equity fund. We know that they exist in cities across the country. Even for example, if we go back to the budget, when we we're talking about the neighborhood investment fund in Cincinnati was brought up as an example. Cincinnati, when they created their neighborhood investment fund, also created an equity fund. Seattle, other cities, as well have this. This is a critical thing for the city of Baltimore because we cannot, we cannot reduce inequities in the city. We cannot erase the decades of racism and all the things that we have in the city of Baltimore without purposely donating dollars to it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Councilman Scott. Uh, Mr. President, you have any comments, sir? No, I have no comments. Thank you. Um, we have agency reports from Department of Finance and the solicitor. Department of Finance is unfavorable. Uh, Mr. Sename, um, is there anything you want to add to the report? Uh, no, nothing to add. I think the report speaks for itself, but happy to answer any questions about it, of course. Thank you, sir. Um, we also have uh, Solicitor uh, Davis with us. I know the Department of Law sent in a letter with comments. Um, Judge Davis, is there anything you'd like to add to your letter? Thank you, sir. Greatly appreciated. Um, do we have anyone from the public who wishes to testify on this bill? Going once, going twice, sold. Okay. We have amendments on our colleagues' debt. Oh, there's questions? Yes. Councilman Scott. Uh, thank you, sir. This question is for, for Mr. Mr. Sinemay, Sin uh, Mr. Budget Director. So in your report, you're talking about uh, the city needing uh, fiscal sound fiscal management for flexibility is one of the reasons why you guys don't think that we should dedicate that amount of money to the fund can you talk about that a little more sure so um, one of the things we talked about was uh, you know good good financial management means that we give ourselves the most flexibility to respond to whatever the needs or priorities are um, in any given year and frankly those change from year to year um, and also to most importantly I think to changing economic conditions I mean we've been in a position over the last few years which I've shared with the council where we've had kind of slow and steady um, revenue growth in the general fund um, that will not uh, last forever it's bound to stop at some point and when we get into a situation where that is not occurring having 
dollars dedicated to certain sources, again, no matter how worthy the cause, and this is a very worthy cause, it limits our ability to respond to the challenge at the moment in that particular year. So uh, this is a follow-up on that, Mr. Sinemay. Sure. So uh, currently, you guys have a, a, a bill introduced in the city council into, this, into the budget committee that would appropriate about $20 million for the police department in overtime, is that correct? Uh, that to close fiscal 18 that yeah, it's a, it's a supplemental request to close fiscal 18. That's right So would you would you say that is uh, sound financial management to? Continuously reward an agency for going severely over budget so um, I think in in you know part of the part of the adjustment we made in the fiscal 19 budget was to get the police budget to a more realistic level um, as I've said to you and to many here, I, uh, there's nobody in this building that, <laughs> that fights harder to control and to get the actual spending under control in the police department. Um, I think as I've told folks here, um, it, it's, it's not as simple as just setting a, a target. It comes down to things like having a better schedule, having accountability within the department, having better technology, uh, and we're pushing for all those things. I don't think it reflects good financial management frankly and it's very disappointing to us but it's also the reality and we have to we have to respond to the reality of the situation so my uh, another follow-up question for you so say for example we were discussing the police overtime fund do we do you think that you guys would be opposing that I'm sorry what sorry I didn't hear the if question. this bill was called 18-022 right. was to a charter amendment to create the Baltimore City Police Department overtime fund, would you be opposing it? We would oppose that too. <laughs> Are you sure about that? <laughs> uh, next question for you, Mr. Cinema. When you, to go back to your, your last question, do you expect, again, uh, for us to ask for more money for police overtime and, and over, above, above the amount required in this year's budget? So uh, going, into, going into fiscal 19, uh, the adjustment that was made to the police department budget was to get them closer to what they've been spending in recent history. Um, I don't know how fiscal 19 will play out, but I think it's incumbent upon the department to make some changes to bring their spending down uh, and, and within a reasonable level. Like I said, some of those things are, are, are controlled or restricted by our contract that we're in right now, which is under negotiation. Some of those things are dependent upon uh, better technology that we can invest in. And some of it, frankly, is based on management too. Um, but that all has to come from the department. We can only take that so far. And my, my last question, before, uh, last two questions, before issuing your report, did you guys reach out to any other cities to see if they had equity funds to see what the impact was on their budgets? Uh, I didn't speak to any other cities in particular. And my last, last question for you, Mr. Cinema. So we discussed during the budget process whether uh, uh, the budget itself was look at, looked at through the lens of equity. And my, if my memory serves me correct, the answer to that question was no. So one, is that true? And two, uh, would you believe that the budget that was just passed by the city council is a budget that considers equity and actually benefits all of Baltimore City's residents, not some versus, versus others? So like I, uh, I discussed in our response to, the, to your earlier bill just about equity program, it's something that we have done a lot of research on that we take seriously, and it's something that I would like to incorporate into our budget process going forward. Um, I think like I shared with you last, last time, our budget process, we look at each agency proposal in terms of how well they meet the, the, the outcomes we're trying to achieve, how well they perform. But another criteria we could look at is, is equity. Um, admittedly, we don't do that today. Many agencies don't. Um, but it's something that we could look at in our budget process going forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Colleagues, anyone else? Councilwoman Clark. I would just like to say that um, this legislation that we did pass the program uh, at a prior council meeting, this is all about the funding, um, and it, this is all about whether or not it is going to be dedicated funding, and um, it looks as if it's not. Um, so that means that we'll have to we'll have to work to make sure that the various agencies of the city of Baltimore um, 
fund, you know, ask for the funding that makes their review of equity on, in terms of gender, race, and economic status um, viable, it's an important thing. And I, what I wanted to say uh, as we vote on this bill is that I have been impressed and amazed at how quickly the notion of equity in those categories has already permeated city government. I see it reflected in already in documents and conversations, and I think that it is an, a sustaining principle that almost now has a life of its own. So if we are not dedicating the funding, um, we should, we would hope that our colleagues in the city agencies would take it into consideration as a function when the next budgets are prepared so that we have some kind of ability within agencies to practice the kinds of equities we're talking about, like just things like where are our capital dollars going? And I think they're going in good places. I'm not, I have no complaints. But just to make sure that they're equitably spread across the city of Baltimore. Services are equitably spread. And this whole notion is one that um, just the language of it has already become part of city government in my brief experience. And it's a good one. So I just wanted to make that point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Great use of the term brief, Councilwoman. Oh, you think it was a little longer than brief? <laughs> no, ma'am. Colleagues, uh, we've also been joined by Councilwoman Shannon Sneed from the 13th District. Councilman Scott. Yeah, I have a quest question uh, for, the, for the law department and someone from the law department can can ask answer this question for me. So uh, in the last, next to the last paragraph, um, when you guys say we predict that forcing a minimum amount of funding into the annual ordinance of estimates as this proposed charter amendment seeks to accomplish will be deemed by the court a legislative act that can only be accomplished by the city's legislative body exercising its legislative power pursuant to Maryland Constitution. Uh, as it says, we, as we know, we have no, council has no power to add amounts to and only can reduce spending contemplated in proposed ordinance of estimates. So question if you guys are saying that that this basically bill as is does not meet legal sufficiency and we already have a uh, similar types of legislation on the books that we earlier this morning that we discussed that we're already rolling out can we can we someone explain why one over the other good evening elena de Pietro from the law department um we actually did not approve the mechanism for the bill that was discussed earlier today, um, but the and the, the the mayor did veto that bill initially, and the city council overrode the veto. So, so okay, so you're saying that this is the same case as that bill that we already have today. Well, thank God for the citizens of Baltimore. I'm done, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Chair. Councilman Scott. Councilman Pinkett? Um, I'm, I'm not certain who these questions would be directed to, so, um, but I did have some questions as, as it relates to um, how the, the funds would be um, utilized. And, and so, like one of them says, provide equitable access to education. So I, I just was curious, what, what, what is equitable access? I mean, in, in the context of Baltimore, what is equitable access to education? Um, I don't know who I should ask. So Councilman Scott is suggesting he has an answer for you. Councilman, do you want to um, discuss that now or do you guys want to table that and, and have a sidebar conversation? So it's up to you, Councilman Pinkett. Councilman Scott's offering to have a sidebar conversation or he can discuss that now, your preference. Um, I, don't, I, mean, I'm, I don't want to assume that I'm the only one that wants to answer. Can you, can you address that question now, Councilman? Thank you. Yeah, uh, uh, Councilman Pinkett. It's, it's, uh, in the vein, actually, of, of, of the 
the youth fund that we discussed earlier is that once the fund is there, but like equitable ac access to education, for example, we know that when you look at, at specific schools in specific neighborhoods and some in, in your district, for example, they don't have the after school program and they don't have the pre-K program and they don't have the other kind of programming that is allotted or, or, or in other areas of, of of the schools but also in other areas of the city and that's the kind of thing that you want to we want to pull back to being able to help help out those areas help out those schools help out those neighborhoods those programs that want to do that but do not have and have not been and in some cases i did say purposely have not been giving the funding to do so so that those neighborhoods stay in the situation that they're in so do we have an assessment of what that what what that dollar figure is to make a no. education um equitable in the city we we don't yet because the no city agency has has not yet even done an equity assessment outside of the planning department um have we have we asked the school system to provide to provide that information yep we uh mr chair the, so the school system itself is going through a process where they're doing that and we'll be able to to uh, get that information from them but I know that that's just something that's very important for Dr. Santelisis and something that they have been going around talking to uh, people throughout the school communities about. Okay thank you. Okay colleagues we have amendments on our desk. Amendment 1 on page 2 strike lines 8 through 10 and replace with 1 money appropriated to the fund in the annual ordinance of estimates. Uh, Councilman Scott these are your amendments or Councilman Blocks? Councilman Block, uh, do you have anything just to add in terms of context, or are you happy with the amendment as is? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to add a little context. You know, um, obviously the issue of equity is something that we all take very seriously. And at the same time, you know, we understand the concerns of the Department of Finance as it relates to budgetary process moving forward. So I do believe these amendments help us to get there in a, in a more clean fashion, one that is uh, fiscally responsible, but then also speaks to the issue of equity in our city. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilman Bullock. Uh, I'll just chime in and say that uh, I certainly agree with your comments wholeheartedly. Um, colleagues, is there a motion to move Amendment 1? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, motion by uh, Bullock, second by Pinkett. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Uh, Councilman Scott is a no. Uh, five yeses, uh, one no. Uh, Risinger is absent. That amendment passes. Um, amendment number two on page two at the end of line 11, uh, delete the period and insert semicolon and. Is there a motion to move that amendment? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, motion by Bullock, second by Scott. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. And that motion, uh, amendment passes 6 nothing with one absent. And then uh, the last amendment, amendment num number three, uh, on page two after line 11, insert, quote, uh, item number three, proceeds from fines, fees, surcharges, or other revenues dedicated to the fund by ordinance, end quote. Is there a motion to move this amendment? So moved. Is there a uh, motion by Bullock, second by uh, Scott? Uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. Motion carries. Uh, we have a bill that is amend amended. Is there a motion to move the bill as amended? Move to approve. Motion by Clark. Is there a second? Second by Scott. All the, uh, we'll do roll, roll call. Uh, Hold up, uh, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. There is a there was a motion by Clark and a second by Scott uh, to move the bill as amended. Uh, we'll do roll call. Bullock. Yes. Pinkett. Yes. Risinger is absent. Scott. Please. Stokes. Yes. Clark. Yes. Costello. Yes. Uh, this bill passes uh, six nothing and moves to. Second reader as amended on June 25th. Our next hearing is at uh, five. Uh, is at 5:30. It's currently 5:28. We're going to recess for approximately 10 minutes. Thank you.
Okay. Uh, Baltimore City Council, Council Bill 18 0264, Charter Amendment. Charter Commission general recommendations. I'm joined to my left by Councilwoman Mary Pat Clark, Vice Chair of the Committee for the 14th District, City Council President Bernard C. Jack Young, Councilman Brandon Scott, Second District Member of the Committee, uh, Councilman uh, Chris Burnett, Eighth District, Councilwoman Shannon Sneed uh, from the 13th District. To my right, uh, Councilman Robert Stokes uh, from the 12th District Member of the Committee, and Councilman Leon Pinkett, Seventh uh, District Member of the Committee. Uh, we are also joined by Rebecca Tab, Independent uh, Attorney for the City Council. Matt Peters, staff to the committee. Kara Kuntz, legislative director for Council President Young. Um, uh, Councilman John Bullock is joining us. He's uh, from the 9th District, member of the committee. Lester Davis, uh, deputy chief of staff to Council President Young. Uh, Carolyn Moselle, um, chief of staff to Council President Young. Michael Huber, uh, director of economic development uh, for Council President Young. Uh, representing uh, Mayor Pugh, I believe, is, is Matt Garbark. And we also have poetry deal from the office of um, government relations as, as well as Andrew Alshire uh, on behalf of the administration um, this is a uh, this is an administration charter amendment um, what we're going to do uh, Mr. Garbark my understanding is you're going to be presenting on behalf of the administration um, I'm going to ask you to provide a, a no more than three minute summary of the, of the bill um, and then uh, I believe we're going to get some testimony from uh, Ms. Ray from legislative reference. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to you, sir. Mr. Chairman, Mr. President, uh, members of the committee, uh, good afternoon. My name is Matt Garbark. I'm Deputy Chief of Staff to Mayor Pugh. I also served as the uh, co-chair of the Mayor's Charter Review Commission. Uh, the commission very briefly included 55 people from business, nonprofit, and academic worlds, as well as residents and students throughout the city. Uh, commission examined the charter, recommended various changes that would clean up and streamline uh, the charter. Uh, Council Bill 18-0264 uh, includes many of the changes the commission recommended to the general provisions, the executive departments, and the franchise articles. It also includes a newly recommended Article 10, which would require a review of the charter at least once every 10 years. This is consistent with what other counties uh, have included in their charters as well. Um, as the Commission learned when we began this process, a charter has specific parameters that are established by the Maryland Constitution. Um, it should basically be a, a basic document that outlines the structure and the organization of government for the city. It should be clear, it should be concise, easy to understand, and it is a charter, it's a document for the citizens of Baltimore to basically understand how their government is, is functioning and how it operates. Um, the changes in this bill uh, would largely take things out of the charter as they are, we believe, too detailed or outside of the basic structure or organizational framework of the charter. Uh, the bill, we are not recommending policy changes necessarily, um, just that they be taken out of the charter um, and remain in or be put in a code either by ordinance or in a regulation or policy. Um, the, um, we believe they should be retained and the many of the policies should be retained and not be included in the charter. At this time, um, there are, in addition to what the bill provided, there are a couple of amendments that the um, administration uh, would like to consider. Um, the first one would uh, protect the water system which would put it into the franchise article, making it uh, what is termed inalienable, which means it cannot be um, sold or distributed or divested in any uh, nature. Um, the next uh, amendment we would uh, request be considered is um, uh, a requirement to publish uh, adequate public notice, to create an ordinance on adequate public notice. I know there were some concerns about taking that out in the uh, charter itself. And finally, there are provisions that would add um, specific uh, reasons for termination of uh, the Director of Legislative Reference. I know that there was some concern about including language, uh, not including language to that effect. So those are um, amendments the administration was uh, considering. Uh, and with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions in more detail or provide any more information as the uh, committee may require. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for the time that you spent 
um, working with me on uh, uh, all kinds of proposals for amendments to this legislation. I I'd just like to say that I would, um, I have amendments, as you know, that preserve um, current language. Current language because I think we agree that we, and you just said it, uh, before we go vague on the kind of notice of hearings that people receive, um, we need a local auto, uh, adequate public notice code bill, a bill that goes into the city code. It doesn't have to be in the charter because it's ch it can change, but it should be a law at least so that people can rely on it. There's going to be a master plan hearing, um, adequate notice. What, how do you hold somebody to that? You can't. But if it's a newspaper of general circulation in Baltimore City, an ad, well, yeah, it either appeared or it didn't. So you can hold people to that. So I, I would look forward to working with whoever on that legislation. The secondly, in that vein, um, I could never support eliminating from the charter all the pages of civil service protections that are there. They're not any place else that I can find in law. There might be regulations, I'm sure there are. I'm talking about something available to the general public to know, uh, for example, in, if I'm a veteran uh, with an uh, honorable discharge, do I still get possible extra credits when I apply for a job? Um, right now, it's the law, but there is no law like that elsewhere, and so perhaps we need to uh, do a code uh, on civil service before we eliminate the guarantees that exist in the charter. So these are things that we need to do getting ready for all these eliminations. Thank you. Okay, um, Mr. Garbark, uh, you have um, three amendments. Can you read the first one again? Um, certainly. The First Amendment would add to the sewer or add to the franchise article uh, the sewer system and water supply system uh, that would make it inalienable. Mm -hmm. It would also specify that such system is not able to be issued a franchise agreement. So in other words, the system cannot be divested from the city and a franchise agreement to operate or function or administer the system cannot be entered into as well. Thank you. Um, I will introduce that amendment on behalf of the administration, um, or I will make a motion for that amendment. Is there a second for that amendment? Is there a written version of that amendment? No, Sorry. not yet. Well, is, is there a second? I don't hear a second. Councilman Scott second. Um, Costello is going to vote no. Clark? Uh, no, I guess. I mean, what are we doing here? We're the administration has amendments? Yes. I, I, I'm ready to vote against the whole bill, actually. Okay. We're voting on this, this amendment right now, which is an administration amendment. Come back to me. Okay. Bullock? Uh, Pinkett? No. Scott? No. Stokes? No. Clark? No. Uh, Mr. Garbark, amendment number two. Um, the second amendment would require an ordinance um, for adequate public notice be enacted by the city council and mayor. Okay. I will move that amendment on behalf of the administration. Is there a second? I'll second it. I see what's happening. and. I think we have an agreement, um, so I'll second it. Costello votes no. Clark? No. Bullock? No. Pinkett? No. Scott? No. Stokes? No. Amendment number three, please. It would add language um, adding the um, 
reasons for which the director of legislative reference would uh, be terminated, uh, which are currently not in there, but uh, would be proposed to be in there. I'll introduce on behalf of the administration. Is there a second? Second. Uh, Costello's no. Clark? Yes. Uh, wait a minute. No. I'm sorry. Clark is a no. Bullock? No. Pinkett? No. Scott? No. Stokes? No. Okay. Um, my understanding is, uh, Ms. Ray, you have uh, testimony on behalf of uh, legislative reference that you'd like to provide? Please. For you to know, pull the mic up. Yep. Can you pull the mic up? You're, it's televised right now. So. Is this, can you hear me now? Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Chairman Costello, President Young, and the members of the City Council that are here for allowing me to speak on behalf of our agency. I am the senior member of the Department of Legislative Reference. I have worked there 30 years. That would include my contract experience with the agency. And we were always set up to serve equally the executive branch of city government and the legislative branch of city government. Um, we have to respect both of these entities. They are our most important clients, and we have to do our best for them. Uh, the way this piece of legislation is set up with the ability of the director to be fired um, for no cause, as the legislation is currently written, um, would open it up to potential problems. Uh, you could have a mayor very angry at the director. They want to get rid of this person. Then you can have who would replace this person. And in the 30 years I've been here, quite frankly, I have seen mayors and uh, city council presidents not always get along well on many issues. Uh, I think we are supposed to. Yes, can you rewind about. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Okay, um, I'm, not, I'm not referring to you, President Young. I'm referring to a previous council president. Um, and I have, I have seen that. And. Um, my, I have reservations as to how that would affect the ability of the agency to function. We are supposed, we are a nonpartisan, we're supposed to be tech, provide technical service and um, advice to both our most important clients. Yes, sir. Um, I don't feel that the, the changes in the charter are going to help us in that respect, and uh, I respectfully offer amendments to simply remove from this piece of legislation all references to the Department of Legislative Reference, and I've attached them to our agency's report. And for those of you who are there, I simply want to say that this is a report that um, myself and Another member of the staff put together it is not coming from the director. He simply gave me carte blanche to do what I wanted with it. Um, and I am concerned about the integrity of our agency. And that is why uh, I've offered this report and these amendments. Do you have, do you have a copy of your testimony? Um, I have the, the report. It's all in the, the report. The report's in the bill file, Mary Pat. It's in the bill file. Um, I do have a copy, I, if you can do that. May I, you come in, I have a question. Mr. President. Oh, sure, I'm sorry. Okay, right now, um, Council Medic Services um, reports directly to the council, um, and we have not um, attempted to fire um, that director since I've been here. Um, the director really don't report to anyone, and he has to report to someone. Someone has to do his evaluations. Um, someone has to make sure that the staff is fully staffed up there. Um, right now, y'all two positions now, okay? Um, the director has to report to someone. Let's, uh, council Medic Services report to the council.
this, uh, le this legislation has, I'm sorry I haven't had a chance to read what, what your amendment is. Your, your amendment is just to remove legislative right, reference entirely from, from this legislation. Yes. And leave things the way they have been. Yes, as they've been since 1966 when the agency was separated out from the state. Previously, we were part of the state agency, and then in 1966, the state went down to Annapolis with its own and set up our agency as an independent body with an independent board of legislative reference, which has actually met over the years when it has needed to meet. And you, it, I'm sorry I can't reread right now while the hearing is going on, but I have read it a couple times here. It seemed fair enough to me, if I'm reading this amendment in the, in the charter bill correctly, mm -hmm. in that, yes, there's a board now that has, I believe, recruitment and hiring policies, um, and that is being replaced, if I'm remembering correctly, by the mayor and the president of the city council. So you have those branches of government with equal votes in that process. So it sounds as if the two legislate, the mayor has legislation, the council has legislation. We desperately rely on, and thank you for all your years of great service. We. We desperately rely on the ability of, uh, on the functioning of the Department of Legislative Reference. Um, otherwise, I don't, and correct me, okay. I don't see, I, yes, the, uh, the, high, the recruitment by a, a, a group that is appointed, but the hiring by these two people's agreement and the an organ and a group and that considers if things aren't going well and recommends maybe discharge that makes recommendations but then those same two people agreeing um, make a decision whatever it is if as i remember from reading this as what, much what, as what is did. currently in the legislation is simply there, the director can simply be fired not for any particular reason. They can just be fired if one of the heads of, I would say, the body, either the mayor or the council, um, there are no protections in there at all for the, for the director of the agency um, and can you can you help me find that part of uh, there's only like four pages in the in here about with of new language can you help me just find help me anyway find that language No, it's in, in the. I was looking at the page 63. I, I'm looking at the bill. Oh, yeah. It says simply the director, it's on page 17 of the bill, the director may be removed from office by the affirmative vote of both the mayor and the president of the city council. Correct. But it doesn't give any reasons and protection. As for example, I believe we're given in the bill, which you will hear tomorrow night, for the Inspector General. But so, are there any protections in the current yes, charter? The, 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 yes, the current, the current position of because the Because we have the current language here the current, before us. The director of the agency is a civil service position. This would remove it from the civil service and make it non-civil service. It's at will. It becomes at will. It becomes at will. But are not most directors in the city government of agencies at will? But this was designed, this position was designed to be um, removed from 
Uh, based more on merit, I would say. It's not moot to me. I just. Based more. I think it was. It was designed to be more based on merit, ability to. It's nonpartisan. It's not a. a no, it's not. No, it's it's. It's not about Democrats, Republicans. No, uh, but it's 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 not taking sides with either of the bodies that are city government. It's to be impartial and a neutral body. That was it. That was why it was originally set up this way um, by the state when they gave us our independence back in 1966. I, here's what I think. I think I walked in and learned that the majority of my members that I serve with, um, and I don't disagree, are basically opposed to this legislation in, in total. And I don't disagree with that given the short period of time there is to get a charter amendment prepared, amended to the voters in time, with, uh, but this one section is one that is still viable and under debate. Um, I think that your own service deserves our respect, uh, but I will say that I think it's a good move. I think that what's happening here is a positive move in that there's some direct supervision of how the, how the, it operates. It's a very hard job for everyone there. It's horrible because of legislation like this, like the whole transform that where the director worked like all the time, that's all he did. So he deserves a lot of respect and that position deserves respect too, but he's the head of an agency. And to me, that should be at will because it, I believe it generally is in all the experience in my knowledge. But I don't think we should disregard your concerns because you deserve our respect. But. I came in here prepared to vote for lots of parts of this bill, but I never even had an amendment for this part. I thought it was fair. And I think there needs to be some kind of boss who can make things happen. Look what has happened to that agency because it lacks, not a person, you got strong people, but it lacks the kind of boss to say, why are you packing us up to move out of our offices? You have no place for us to go. Now we're a library that has its books in boxes for months on end. Do and you, now. Do you think we liked that? I know. We didn't like that. I know. And no one has the authority there to get the kind of attention a bureaucracy requires to treat an agency with respect. That, that's my concern. It is so important. The people there are so hardworking and talented and skilled, and it needs, man, it needs bosses, a boss, to represent it with other bosses, at will bosses throughout the city agencies in the city. Well, I wouldn't disagree because the character, I've been there long enough to know that the previous director who left in 1996 um, was considered by the mayor to be, that agency was part of, considered to be part of the mayor's cabinet because I do remember that director coming and participating in the mayor's cabinet which was held every Monday as I remember. And his campaign. And, uh, you know, it, it, was, it was given a little more prominent place 
and, and we did a lot of legislation for both the council and that mayor who was in office at that time. In this case, however, and I don't, I'm, I'm done. I respect you too much to try to debate this here, with, uh, but okay. in this case, you got to have both votes. You can't just, there's not three people and you can get two like the board, you know, it's not the board of estimates. No. Thanks. Thank you, Councilwoman. Um, you say, Councilman Scott, you have an amendment? Yes, sir, Mr. Chair. I move to amend uh, the char this charter amendment to remove all proposed amendments to Bill 18-0264 except uh, Article 7, Sections 90 through 93 that pertain to the Department of Legislative Reference. This amendment removes all proposed language except the change proposed on page 16 beginning on line 18 through page 19 ending with line 16. Is there a second to that amendment? Second by Councilman Pinkett. Um, all those in favor of that amendment say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. That amendment passes. Is there a motion to move the bill favorably as amended? So moved, Mr. Chair. A motion by Scott. Is there a second? Second by Clark. Uh, Bullock? Yes. Uh, Pinkett? Yes. Uh, Scott? See. Si. Stokes? Rising or absent, Clark? Yes. Costello, yes. This bill moves to second reader on June 25th. Uh, we are now in recess. <laughs>